I'm Ann Helmreich and I'm the Associate Director of the Baker Nord Center. On behalf of the Director Tim Beal and myself, we'd really like to welcome you so much for coming. I know it's close to the end of the semester, so we so appreciate you coming here to join us. This is our third presentation in a series by visiting scholars um, as part of our information seminar um, at, at the Baker Nord Humanities Center. And we all had a um, Brent's lecture last week was, was fin two weeks ago now, time flies, was fantastic, so thank you. It's my deep pleasure to introduce today's speaker, W.J.T. Mitchell. Professor Mitchell is the Gaylord Donnelly Distinguished Service Professor of English Language and Literature and a member of the Art History Department at the University of Chicago. He's also been the editor of Critical Inquiry since 1978. Now pertinent today's, to today's purposes, which are to think critically about information and particularly about visual information, Mitchell has described himself as, quote, a literary scholar moonlighting in the visual arts and a migrant worker in the fields of art history, aesthetics, and media studies, end quote. He has published numerous essays and texts on the intersection of these fields and most recently, What Do Pictures Want? The Lives and Loves of Images in 2005. And in many ways, this book is a continuation of his earlier prize-winning work found in picture theory, Essays on Verbal and Visual Representation from 1994. In many ways, I find the problems that our speaker engages with to be epitomized by a few lines from William Blake's There Is No Natural Religion. And if you've read um, Professor Mitchell's work, you'll know why I'm choosing Blake. So from Blake's There Is No Natural Religion, a few selected lines. Man's desires are limited by his perceptions. None can desire what he has not perceived. Reason, or the ratio of all we have already known, is not the same that it shall be when we know more. So today, we shall know more about the twin evils of cloning and terrorism through the benefit of our guest talk entitled Cloning Terror, The War of Images 9-11 to Abu Ghraib. Please join me in welcoming W.J.T. Mitchell and thanking him for taking on this topic straight out of the headlines. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And I want to thank uh, uh, Case Western and especially Tim Beal for uh, hosting me here. It's, uh, this is, uh, it feels a little bit like home now. I came back yesterday. and. Went to the Cavs game last night. Unfortunately, they didn't win, but uh, uh, still, good game. Uh, and um, it's given me a chance also to get acquainted with Cleveland a bit and they, uh, find out why it is the city of light, city of magic. Uh, <laughs> um, if any of you have come to hear a well-organized scholarly paper, um, the, uh, then you're in for a big disappointment. Uh, I am in the midst of a uh, book project which started about uh, five years ago, really started on September 11th, 2001. Uh, and, uh, but I feel like it's coming to a sort of closure now. Uh, and that's what I want to begin with is, um, the, the, I've been giving versions of this lecture for a couple of years, uh, really all over the place. And, um, uh, it, but this is the first time I've uh, given it s since the election of uh, 2006, which is uh, a, an important event in the story that I want to tell. Uh, it, it seems to me that the meaning of that election is uh, reasonably clear. Uh, it was. Uh, a statement, uh, a speech act by the uh, people of the United States that this war is over uh, or had better be over or uh, an acknowledgement that it is unwinnable, that it perhaps was a mistake in the first place or, and you could go on with numerous other explanations of what, what the vote meant. But it, it does, I think, give a kind of closure which I feared for a while was never going to come, uh, especially in 2004, uh, the, uh, the day after that election, uh, I had to give a, a talk on a similar subject in Berlin, and uh, 
the, the depression was palpable. I'm sure you could all remember uh, the, the second week of November in 2004 when we felt that uh, despite every scandal, every conceivable piece of evidence that this war was a terrible mistake uh, from start to finish, that um, it was going to go on indefinitely. And of course that was also part of the definition of uh, the war on terror, that the war on terror could never end. Uh, it was open-ended. And in, in that sense, there are still a lot of people who think it ought to go on uh, and will go on uh, indefinitely. But uh, in the uh, spring of 2004, uh, this image appeared, which is pretty much the icon for my entire discourse, uh, the, the famous Abu Ghraib man also called the man on the box, uh, and he has many other names which I'll be talking about later. Uh, but this appeared over a, a Los Angeles freeway, and I think announced the moment when uh, it was widely recognized, especially inside the US military, that the war was lost. Uh, when the Abu Ghraib images first appeared, uh, there was a teach-in at Northwestern University that I participated in, and uh, I showed this image among others, and a comment was made by the head of naval ROTC at Northwestern, uh, a, a naval captain uh, who was there in his dress whites, and said, this image is more dangerous to the, the U.S. forces in Iraq than any weapons of mass destruction that could have been found there, because it completely undercuts the, uh, the moral status of the mission there. And when all of the strategic aims and tactical aims and uh, security aims of a war have been exhausted, as they had by that point, uh, he said, the only thing left is the moral excuse, that we are there to do something, something good for Iraq. And now that, the, the, this image has given the lie to that. And uh, so in that sense, the, uh, it, the war is over. Uh, a lot of people, I think, recognized, I mean, the people of the world, if you could trust the millions who protested the war at the beginning, knew that it was over before it started, knew that it, would n it could only come uh, down to civil war, uh, chaos, anarchy, and so forth. Um, but that has taken a long time to dawn and I, uh, on the uh, U.S. government. And I think the way I see this scenario playing out to its final end game is that George W. Bush will be the last man on earth uh, who believes that uh, we should stay the course. He's still saying it uh, as of uh, today. Uh, he just had breakfast with the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Iraq this morning. Um, so now that the war in Iraq has been officially or unofficially declared over, or at least unwinnable, it might be time to admit that the same thing should be said about the war on terror. Um, and, and it might also be the time to admit that losing uh, the war on terror, which we are doing, uh, is even more disastrous than the, the, the defeat in Iraq. Uh, because what it means, what losing to terrorists mean, is not being conquered by a military power. No terrorist organization has ever conquered by force uh, a nation state. What they have done is to pr produce a political cataclysm, uh, an implosion of the uh, constitutional character of nation states. And that's the, the objective of terrorism. Terrorism never wins by military force. It only wins by what you might call imaginary force. Um, and undermining uh, a nation's constitution from within. And in that sense, in my view, George W. Bush has been the greatest collaborator that the terrorists uh, could ever have imagined. He was the perfect sovereign uh, for this, this uh, strategy. Let me just say a word about the concept, the war on terror or the war on terrorism. Uh, I would hardly be the first to say, in fact, almost every pundit has made this observation, that this is a metaphor. That, I mean, literally, there is no such thing as a war on terror. It's uh, an incoherent uh, and uh, perhaps a mixed metaphor. That is, you can't make a war on an emotion, like terror, or a state of mind. 
And you can't make a war on a tactic, which terrorism is. Uh, it's a tactic of politics, war. Um, it, it's a completely misplaced notion of, of what a war can do. You can make a war against a nation state or some determinate social entity, a people, a community, a civilization. Uh, and it is possible to make a figurative war on a social or biological formation. In fact, this phrase, war on X, has generally been for things like poverty uh, or early in the 20th century, the war on typhus. Uh, uh, but everyone who uh, used the metaphor that way understood that that war was simply a way of saying, we're really serious. This is going to be a maximum effort. Uh, it does not mean, and should not mean, uh, the mobilization of armies and weapons of mass destruction. But unfortunately, that is exactly what happened. The, in other words, a, a metaphor was literalized. Uh, or, to put it another way, an image, an imaginary uh, notion, like a war on terror, was made real. Uh, and this was actually stated quite explicitly by Donald Rumsfeld, who uh, said at one point, when somebody said, you realize this war on terror, that this is a metaphor? He said, no, absolutely not. It's not a metaphor. And for, for once, uh, alas, God help us, he was right. It, he had, he and his henchmen had taken a metaphor, taken an image, and made it real. But very strange things happen when a metaphor is taken literally or an image stops being imaginary or virtual. Images tend to burst out of their frame and wreak havoc on the world. The fantasy becomes real. And in fact, this was also the explicit strategy of and a quite conscious uh, uh, view of neoconservative ideology, which repeatedly insisted against what they called reality-based thinking that uh, we create reality. And I want to quote uh, from the New York Times, October 17th, 2004, just before the election. Uh, Ron Suskind, uh, former Wall Street Journal reporter, uh, had a meeting with a as yet unidentified senior advisor to uh, the president. Uh, you can make up whoever you, you want to fill this role. But here's what he said, according to Suskind. The, the aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who, quote, believe that solutions emerge from a judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murdered some, murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world works really anymore. Uh, we're an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors. And you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do." Unquote. Well, that has been my aim, actually, for the last five years, to study what we do or what they did uh, at, and at the level of images and metaphors and how these images and metaphors got out of their control, how the genie got out of the bottle and it was impossible to put back. Um, one part of the, the notion of a war of images, uh, a war that's constituted and motivated by a metaphor or an image, uh, is that it always involves moments of iconoclasm. Uh, remember before uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, the famous uh, incident of the Buddhist idols, which the Taliban uh, blew up. And after the invasion of Iraq, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 the destruction of the World Trade Center itself was an act of iconoclasm, the destruction of a monument uh, to capitalism, to globalization, as the name World Trade Center indicates. But its destruction, uh, the destruction of that image, of the icon of the World Trade Center, was at the same time the production of an image. Iconoclasm, 
and I think Brent uh, uh, showed this quite, quite nicely last time. Uh, iconoclasm is always double. That is, it destroys an image, but it creates one. And the image of destruction is what's supposed to be remembered. This is why iconoclasm is rarely a private act. No point in destroying an image in the secrecy of your uh, apartment. You want to do it out there where it can be seen and the act of destruction can have an impact. Um, and often the act of iconoclasm produces a kind of conversion effect. The Buddhist statues were a matter of relative indifference, I think, to most of the world until they were destroyed. And then they became uh, uh, part of a, uh, a sacred cause. And they certainly contributed to the demise of the Taliban, who had <coughs> carried it out. Uh, the Twin Towers, it's hard to remember now. The Twin Towers were regarded as kind of brutalist, mediocre architectural disfigurations of Lower Manhattan. Uh, they were not re widely admired by architects, critics, or the dwellers of Lower Manhattan, except they were a good place to look down on the rest of Manhattan. Um, and after their destruction, they were immediately resurrected, as this image uh, suggests, as uh, holy icons, hallowed ground, uh, and exaggerated in importance to, until the word ground zero was applied to them, equating them with Hir Hiroshima. If you've looked at memorials of Hiroshima uh, and you compare them to the, our inability to create a memorial to the World Trade Center, you get some sense of the, uh, the way in which a mysterious transformation occurs, uh, turning something that was a matter of pretty much of indifference to most Americans into uh, a sacred symbol. Uh, this, by the way, was put online by uh, Pastor Tony Mavrakos, who provided this text explaining it. Can you all read that? Is it clear enough? Uh, my favorite part of it is they're gone, but standing where they once stood are two other twin towers that no one can take down, including terrorists, the American judicial system, the ACLU, <laughs> or the American atheists, your brother in Christ. Um, I'll come to uh, this moment of iconoclasm as well in a minute. A more delicate approach is required then when an image is loosed on the world and transformed into an idol of the mind, which I think the World Trade Centers were. The September 11th has now also become a kind of iconic phrase, uh, which uh, automatically stops conversation. You say it and you say things like, uh, you probably can remember the whole mantra people went through. Postmodernism is now dead, irony is now dead, skepticism is now dead. Uh, since September 11th, uh, we have learned to be serious, etc. Uh, and and um, uh, above all, liberalism and secularism is dead. Now we know we have a holy war on our hands. Um, and of course, one way of conducting a holy war is to knock down the idols of the enemy. Immediately, we turn to iconoclastic strategies too, as this uh, image suggests. Well, how can we talk about this without simply enumerating the images and counter images in a war uh, of images? I'm suggesting a, as a methodological procedure, a kind of critique of images that avoids iconoclasm, that does not dream of smashing images or uh, getting them out of the way to some reality which we could then all agree on. Um, my strategy is derived from Nietzsche's preface in the Twilight of the Idols, where he talks about combating the eternal idols that bedevil the human mind uh, by philosophizing with a hammer, or, and then he revises the metaphor and says, make that a tuning fork, a tuning fork to strike the idols, uh, <coughs> to reveal not only their hollowness, since idols are always sounding brass, uh, they, they, they are hollow things, uh, but not only to expose their hollowness, but their specific resonances, their peculiar harmonies and disharmonies, and the sort of mad melodies that we play upon them. So that's what I'm proposing to do in analyzing the war on terror as a war of images. That is, a war about images fought for the sake of images, a war in which images serve as weapons and as targets or victims of violence. 
We know that the war on terror was launched as the simultaneous destruction and production of an image, a, a classic act of iconoclasm. Uh, so it produced a spectacle that was uh, heightened by the gap between the two impacts. I think everyone now uh, understands this, ensuring that the scene of destruction would make a maximum visual impression on the eyes of the world's media, an impression that would be engraved in collective memory as a traumatic spectacle that would, like all traumas, produce a whole set of s secondary symptoms, panic, anxiety, obsessive and compulsively repetitive behavior, uh, failure to learn from experience, paranoia, and above all, an inability to mourn properly, to let go of the dead. The history of the ill-advised and incoherent military reaction known as the War on Terror and the equally incoherent effort to properly memorialize the destruction of the World Trade Center has to be seen then as, as parallel and connected symptoms of an inability to come to terms with history or reality and an inability to overcome the pathological effects of the idol of the mind created on September 11th. It's as if a plague of images had been loosed on the people of the United States and all the efforts at finding a cure or an immunization for these images had only effect, the effect of making the disease worse. And that's one meaning of the phrase, the most obvious meaning of the phrase cloning terror, that in effect it's the, uh, the last phrase in the sentence, the war on terror has had the effect of, that is the, the, th the cure we sought, the antidote turned out to be a kind of accelerator for the disease itself. It had the effect of cloning terror. So th this project is an effort to apply uh, the science of images or iconology to the current image war, to analyze the ways in which the war on terror has been imagined and conducted by means of images in a wide variety of media. How those images have been produced and re reproduced and what their characteristic features are, their recurrent motifs, iconographic patterns, so forth. Now, it should make it clear, all wars have been wars of images. In that sense, this is, is not, nothing new. Uh, the manipulation of images, desecration of enemies, the enemy's sacred symbols, the use of image technologies, uh, such as distant surveillance, espionage, and above all, the deployment of propaganda images. Uh, especially caricatures of the enemy, to inspire heroic sacrifice. All these are as old as warfare itself. So what's different about the war on terror? Um, I would say, first, it's produced a quantitative and a, and a qualitative uh, leap forward in the character of image war. This is partly because the war was launched by an image. Uh, but that's often been true. The destruction of some uh, iconic object uh, is, is one of the best ways if you want to enrage a people, mobilize a nation, destroy their, their sacred cow. Uh, but it, I, it's more fundamental than, than that. Uh, th this may be the first war in human history in which the enemy was almost completely imaginary. It's been a war, in other words, without a proper or determinate object a specifiable target or a locatable enemy like a nation or a religious ideology. So this goes back to the, the, the notion of the metaphor of the war on terror, that the war, war was bound to be phantasmatic uh, in the sense that uh, in, in the, the image would play a much greater role in it because it was uh, a war against an imaginary enemy, and, which does not mean that there aren't any terrorists out there. Obviously, I'm not so naive to think that this is all just in our minds, but uh, they are not an enemy you could ever make a war on. War does not work <laughs> against terrorism. Uh, I think uh, everyone who had a, a brain in their head realized from the first that uh, uh, police work, uh, intelligence, uh, and uh, espionage, very highly targeted violence, was the answer to this, uh, and not a war in, of occupation in a, a Middle Eastern country. Um, so, an imaginary enemy mobilizes a real army. Um, 
but terror itself remains a shapeshifter, capable of taking on any form, able to duplicate its numerous avatars endlessly, uh, and those avatars are some of the things I'll be talking about. So, an icon if you're going to do an iconology of an image war like this, it can't simply be an iconography, a, a listing of images or compilation. It has to examine the underlying logic of image production and consumption, and especially the secondary or framing images or meta pictures that govern the life of images in a specific epoch. So I'm not just talking, in other words, about the history of politics and warfare in our time, but also the history of uh, the image repertoire itself and the, the technologies of image production. And there's a chapter in my new book called The, the Work of Art in the Age of Bio-Cybernetic Reproduction, about, which leads to my next point, which is that, that we, we are now in a different era from Walter Benjamin's age of mechanical uh, production, when images, the prototypical image was the chemical-based photograph and the, the mechanical copy. Uh, we now live in, in a time when copies can be produced genetically, biologically, uh, and digitally. And, and copies both on the side of uh, commodities and, and living organisms and on the side of images take on a much more virulent life in this period, uh, the period I'm calling biocybernetics or the age of the bio picture. Uh, Many people observed uh, d during the age of mechanical reproduction uh, what's been called a pictorial turn. That is, the fact that more pictures than ever were there in the world. But there's been a second turn, I think, and it's re relatively recent. It uh, coincides with the genetic revolution uh, and the invention of its figurehead, the, the, what you might call the meta-picture of biocybernetics itself, and that is the clone, the, uh, the figure of the artificially duplicated uh, organism. So that's the framework within which an iconology of the war on terror as a war of images, I think, has to be framed. Or let me put it in a simpler way. Uh, here's, the, um, here's my exemplar, my avatar of the, uh, the bio picture. In fact, it's the first, one of the early films, Hollywood films, that uh, played with the topic of cloning. You remember Jurassic Park, 1994. And this is a still image when the velociraptors, the, the new model dinosaurs, uh, who have been cloned from extinct DNA, break into the control room of Jurassic Park. Uh, and the DNA code that cloned the dinosaurs is projected on the dinosaur's skin here. So he's sort of caught in the headlights of the, the, the projector lamp. Uh, and uh, this is a still, lasts only a second. But to me, uh, like many film stills, as Roland Barr says, they really capture something that passes by in an instant. The, this is an image of biocybernetic uh, reproduction, and it is also an image of terror. Because that's what a dinosaur is, the terrible lizard the terrible creatures who had to disappear so that we could uh, take over the earth. They had to go extinct. And now we have brought them back. We re-loose terror on the world. It's as if Ju Jurassic Park was producing an animal fable that predicted the age of terrorism and biocybernetics, uh, along with the, the need for digital imaging, because the other revolution in media that was occurring in Jurassic Park was the transformation of uh, animation itself. How do you animate an image artificially? Well, the old way was to either photograph a robot or uh, a puppet uh, or to do a lot of drawing. Uh, the, the new way, which uh, um, Spielberg explored and developed in Jurassic Park, was computer animation. So this is an emblem also of a new image regime, the, the image regime of, uh, uh, on the one side, uh, digital animation uh, and the digitized image, and on the other side, of the clone, of the digitized organism that can be duplicated indefinitely. 
But here's another way to depict my topic. And that's just to put these two images next to each other and try to ask how do they resonate with one another. Dolly the sheep and the destroyed twin towers. There is something uncanny about the fact that they were twins. Uh, Jean Baudrillard noted uh, some time ago uh, that they were already architectural clones and uh, that they were, as clones, uh, indistinguishable from one another. Of course, that's not literally true. One of them had a radio tower on top, the other one didn't. But both of them are headless and faceless. Most uh, skyscrapers, uh, think of the Empire State Building, for instance, or the Chrysler Building, they have a crown, they have a head, they have something that gives them a face. But the uh, Twin Towers were faceless and headless. And this uh, is going to turn out to be a central feature of the clone. Dolly, you may say, has a face, uh, but how do you know it's Dolly? How do you know I'm not showing you a picture of some other sheep? Uh, I, I'm just taking the word of the uh, Google website where uh, I, I found it. Uh, it could be a fake. And of course, the uh, one of the, the problems with cloning is the, the, the anxiety about loss of identity, about duplication, and duplication reaching not into the world of pictures and, uh, and images, but into the world of living organisms, uh, transforming them, mutating them, uh, and replicating them indefinitely. Uh, so I, I want you to think of this kind of diptych, uh, the conjunction of the clone and the moment of the uh, production of terror uh, as, in a way, the, the, uh, the twin images that this entire project circulates around. On the one hand, you've got the image of iconoclasm and destruction, uh, violence and death, and the new, the new mode of war that has been launched in, uh, in our time. Uh, a, a war conducted by means of international terrorism. Uh, and on the other hand, the new mode of reproduction of life, uh, of artificial production of life. So they are, in a sense, the diptych of life and death uh, and of uh, the, the, the biological sciences, techno-sciences, and their most recent emergent development on the one side, and the sciences of death and destruction. Uh, the, the new art of war, on the other hand, which centrally involves uh, suicide. Um, okay, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to uh, basically be taking you through a slideshow, try to ask the question, how do these two images resonate? How can we clang them together to make, uh, to make sense out of this period? And there are three ways, three kinds of relationships that I, I want to suggest uh, right off the bat. One is what you might call simple coincidence. The second is similarity or iconographic resemblance. And the third is convergence, uh, identity. That is the, the convergence of the discourse of cloning with the discourse of terrorism. But let me start with uh, coincidence. This is the uh, front page of the New York Times from September 11th, 2001. Needless to say, there's nothing on the front page of the New York Times from this day about September 11th. It's only about September 10th. And the off-lead story right here, scientists urge bigger supply of stem cell. Report backs cloning. This is the uh, report of the uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, highly critical of the recent decision by the Bush administration to limit stem cell research uh, on the grounds that cloning uh, is an unnatural act, that it's against religious uh, doctrine. Uh, the, the Bush administration's faith-based science policy had already kicked in uh, before his first full year in office uh, it had taken place. So the um, uh, and, and this was one of those feeble attempts to hold back the, uh, 
the steamroller of the Bush administration's faith-based policies. Uh, now, it just so happens that headline is there on September 11th, but it was also there on September 10th and September 6th, September 1st, and in the month of August, there were 60 stories in the New York Times uh, on cloning. So this is what I mean by coincidence. The fact that th these two things were the major issues that were dominating public debate in, in, in this period. Although, up until September 11th, terrorism was really not on the agenda. You recall, it, there was a man named Richard Clark inside the White House who was trying desperately to get their attention. There was a national intelligence estimate that was reporting in early August. Uh, you, you know, we are about to be attacked. Planes are going to fly into buildings. The whole scenario was laid out. Later, of course, Condi Rice said, uh, uh, well, they didn't say which building uh, or which airplanes. You know, we need to have you know, accurate intelligence. So, but that was not on the agenda. What was on the agenda was cloning. And it was really a losing wedge issue. Uh, Bush's popularity was almost as low as it is now. It was down in the high 30s, low 40s. Uh, September 11th, the day this report appears, is a, a day that marks the moment when the scientific community said, enough is enough. Uh, we, we can't conduct science uh, or technological development on the basis of religious phobias. Uh, of course, there are ethical issues. Scientists recognize that. But um, uh, it's as if this is the day the page, a page of history turned from cloning to terrorism. On September 12th, there's nothing about cloning in the New York Times, and there won't be for almost two, three years. Now you notice it's coming back uh, as an issue. So this is what I mean by coincidence. It's not that there's a cause and effect relation, it's that there's an adjacency in history. And I think it would be it's an interesting question. I've asked historians this. You know, what makes a coincidence more than a coincidence in history? Is there a theory of coincidence that historians rely on to tell them when the simultaneous occurrence of two events or two processes, because we're not really talking about just a single event, but about the coincidence of uh, cloning, a techno-scientific discovery and advance with and the emergence of a new form of war. Uh, so what makes the, uh, how does that signify? This is a genuine question. I'm not, it's not a rhetorical question. Uh, I haven't yet found a historian who says, oh yes, we have a theory of coincidence. Here's, go look it up. Uh, this is what, uh, explain the whole thing. Carlo Ginsburg said, the only thing we have is a notion of uh, uh, zeitgeist, and that's completely pathetic. So uh, don't rely on that. Then there was this, I, I put this in as coincidence, but I could also talk about it as convergence. This is one of the first works of art that was made uh, after the destruction of the Twin Towers. The, a photograph, while the dust is still in the air, of the ruins of the World Trade Center. This is by Kevin Clark and Mikey Flowers. Mikey Flowers is a florist down the street. So before the site was completely cordoned off, he got in, made this photograph. And then Kevin Clark uh, reprinted the photograph with the DNA code hovering over it, the letters of the, uh, the, 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 the four letters of the DNA code. Uh, it's as if, and I'm, I leave it to, I'm not going to try to analyze this image in detail for you. We uh, spend a lot of time thinking about the melancholy significance of it. Uh, certainly, one of the things that is a fact, has to be a fact, is that the DNA of the victims and of the suicide terrorists was mingled and hovering in the dust over Manhattan for days to come, and everyone was breathing it. It's as if uh, the, the, uh, the population of New York City was breathing in the remains of the dead. Uh, and it's also true that was very toxic that uh, people are now uh, suffering all kinds of lung disorders because of this, uh, also because of asbestos and many other kinds of toxic uh, entities. But this is, I think, a terrific image of the inability to mourn. Of the, if, if the DNA code means that there's something that doesn't die, 
and that can be resurrected indefinitely, that is cloned, uh, then they, this is about the fact that these deaths continue to live, continue to be uh, a toxin in uh, the system, and quite literally in the system of the people who breathe this in, but also people breathed all this in through their eyes, let's face it. The obsessive focus on this site um, over the next uh, five years, which is still not resolved, as you can see. Uh, it, it, it really is about the failure to mourn. But how did uh, Mikey Flowers and Kevin Clark know this in the, the weeks after 2001? The, the idea of suddenly laying the DNA code over it was, I think, a brilliant and kind of uh, a chilling uh, perception. And many of the things I'm going to be showing you have to do with the way artists uh, reacted to this. But let me, so that's my two examples uh, for this point of adjacency or coincidence. Now, how about resemblance? Well, the way I got to this was just by entering the words clone and terrorist in my Google image search. Here's what I got for terrorists. These are Palestinian fighters on the streets of Ramallah. And here's what the first thing I got for clones. Terrorists, clones. Uh, they have a kind of resemblance. They're all carrying guns. They're all masked, faceless, identical. Uh, and this it becomes a kind of leitmotif in the discussion of both the figure of the terrorist and the figure of the clone. Uh, the, the idea that there are cloned armies uh, out there, and this is uh, George Lucas's uh, depiction of what a cloned army would look like. Of course, they look pretty much like Hitler's armies, don't they? And uh, when you start following up this thread into uh, the, the world of American popular fantasy, which, as Tim Beale will tell you, is filled with the most strange and wonderful creatures, uh, you, you find that um, there are websites and uh, online tabloids uh, telling you that uh, uh, Hitler himself is being cloned by Osama bin Laden somewhere in uh, uh, Afghanistan in a cave near Tora Bora. Uh, and that uh, he, he has also gotten the DNA of uh, 500 of Hitler's elite stormtroopers and is uh, cloning these 500 blonde, blue-eyed warriors who will be trained to have uh, perfect American accents and, uh, be, and be skilled in every kind of warfare. Uh, and, and they are, of course, they, they're only about five years old now, but uh, th this is going to be a long war, uh, an endless war, so uh, these guys are on their way. Um, there's also, uh, my, I think my favorite of the tabloid reports is the one that concerns uh, the possibility that Bush himself might relax his restrictions on cloning in view of the military's difficulty in finding enough recruits for the, the U.S. Army. Uh, so, this is all, I mean, incredible fantasy. I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting I ground anything on this. I'm asking, what grounds this sort of fantasy that, that makes uh, these iconic similarities and these convergences of uh, terrorism and cloning occur? And you may also notice that cloning fits perfectly into the ancient phobia about the crowd or the faceless mass, the, uh, the, the headless mob, or even worse, the highly regimented mob in which every uh, single individual has been engineered perfectly. Remember, the, the, the backstory is that this is one stormtrooper, or a, a one uh, bounty hunter. Uh, who, who is it? Jabba Fett, yeah. And he's been, the, all the clones have been re-engineered to make them a little more disciplined because they, they don't want anybody improvising uh, in, in the clone army. They want them to march in lockstep to their death. Uh, the other thing about clones is they are always destined, or almost always destined, for suicide. In the some 100 movies since the Jurassic Park that deal with cloning as a premise, the notion that the clone is a kind of uh, creature of um, destined for death, destined for early death because clones age more rapidly, Dolly died soon, or destined for early organ donation. If you've read uh, 
the uh, the novel uh, the guy remains of the day um, yeah uh, Ishiguro's novel what's the title again never let me go, never let me go. Uh, the, the word cloning that doesn't appear in the novel till about page 200 but uh, the whole time you uh, you know some they are destined for something and what they are destined for is to be organ donors the re recent Hollywood film the island takes up basically the same uh, premise that the the clone is a kind of uh, a, a suicidal figure, uh, an, an altruistic suicidal figure, in Durkheim's terms, not uh, not committing suicide because he's depressed, uh, or because uh, uh, you know she can't cope, but precisely uh, as a social function, uh, suicide as uh, an act of social solidarity, um, giving your life. So the clone is the perfect creature of this, and organ donation has uh, often been seen as the scenario uh, for the clone, which is why the clones preferably would be engineered not to have very highly developed consciousnesses, uh, not to have souls, uh, but to have, simply have human bodies capable of sustaining their organs, uh, but not much in the way of brains. So it's important that, like the Twin Towers, they be headless or faceless. Uh, anonymous. Okay, so uh, these are resemblances, similarities. Now let me talk a little bit about convergences. Convergences first at the level of policy uh, and ideology and politics. This is a, uh, a colleague of mine at University of Chicago named Leon Cass. Uh, can you all read it? It's, uh, this is Cass's testimony uh, during the Clinton administration to the President's Advisory Commission on uh, stem cell research. And as you'll see, w what Cass does is to um, associate cloning with father-daughter incest, uh, even with consent, <laughs> or having sex with animals, or eating human flesh, or rape and murder. And then he says, uh, there is no need to give a rational justification for our revulsion at these practices. Uh, they, they are all, we have an instinctive revulsion to all of them. And then the conclusion, uh, in my view, our repugnance at human cloning belongs in this category. That is associated here with bestiality, uh, with rape, with uh, uh, incest, uh, cannibalism. Uh, just about every moral taboo you can think of and is then transferred to uh, the question of human cloning. Cass, of course, while doing this, deliberately blurs the line between the question of reproductive and therapeutic cloning. My own position on cloning, which I uh, did not make up, I just got it from my, um, uh, my GP, who is the head of the uh, uh, medical ethics uh, study group at the University of Chicago. He said, basically, Tom, it's simple. Uh, reproductive cloning, no. Uh, therapeutic cloning, yes. Uh, it's stupid to try to make uh, whole organisms to reproduce them. They won't be viable. Uh, terrible idea. Uh, when it becomes a possible idea, then we, then we will have to confront uh, deep ethical issues. But in the meantime, therapeutic cloning uh, rather good idea. But Leon Cass is um, the, the, one of the main figures who has uh, tried to consistently blur this, this distinction and to make it uh, seem as if, if you're one for one, then you're for the other. And of course, Leon Cass then was tapped immediately uh, by George W. Bush to be the chairman of the Bioethics Commission uh, during the Bush administration. And Immediately, Cass then made the, the next leap after September 11th. Since September 11th, one feels a palpable increase in America's moral seriousness. We more clearly see evil for what it is. We understand the need for a prudent middle course, avoiding the Os in inhuman Osama bin Ladens on the one side and the post-human brave new worlders on the other. So uh, cloning, terrorism, uh, both hideous evils in, in their different ways, so, and we will chart a middle course. I guess b somewhere between terrorism and cloning, we'll, we'll find our way. Uh, 
as you can tell, there is not unanimity among my faculty at the uh, <laughs> University of Chicago. So at the level of policy, these things were being brought together. And of course, this is not unique to cloning, since terrorism has been uh, used as an alibi to justify almost anything that uh, comes into George W. Bush's head. Now let me show you a place in explicit political campaign rhetoric as diagnosed by one of my favorite cartoonists, Aaron Magruder, uh, who writes the, um, the strip called Boondocks for the Chicago Tribune, nationally syndicated. Uh, what I think Magruder realized was that uh, Karl Rove, in his uh, infinite wisdom, had sensed that cloning slash terrorism were the icons of the two most important hot button issues. That between them, cloning and terrorism basically took care of domestic and foreign policy. <laughs> uh, cloning, because it deals with, uh, well, terrorism, obviously, because it deals with international politics, the, with the war, with our relations to the axis of evil and all other nations who are either with us or against us in that war. So terrorism really covers it there and, and makes, it, it does what Carl Schmitt recommended as the, the fundamental lesson of the powerful uh, sovereign. That is, politics is about uh, war and hate and it requires an enemy. And believe me, all of the Chicago neocons who were reading Carl Schmitt uh, and reading Leo Strauss were transmitting this into the corridors of power. When people say, uh, as the New York Times did a couple years ago, theory is dead. I said, oh no, it's alive and well. <laughs> they, and it uh, came out of University of Chicago and Leo Strauss's seminars and it found its way uh, into the Bush administration uh, where it uh, in encountered reality uh, and triumphed over it for a time. But the, the other th issue that Karl Rove sensed was, let's make it a fight about sex about abortion, about women's reproductive rights, uh, and above all, about homosexuality. Because after all, what is a clone? Let me just anticipate a couple slides forward. Uh, the first time the word clone really got into the um, American lingo was in the uh, Life and Times of Al Parker, gay su superstar. And why is he a clone? Why, why were gay males called a clone? Because they were cloning masculine stereotypes. Remember, we used to be able to tell a gay man. Uh, you could tell him because his pinky was raised in this way. Or he held a teacup the wrong way. Or he had a slightly effeminate uh, manner about him. But in the 1980s, Al Parker came along and showed that gay men could successfully impersonate straight men. In fact, could be even more macho than they are. Uh, so the cult of gay weightlifting, of leather guys, of bikers, uh, leather bars, uh, and it, above all, this, this kind of figure uh, was a, a way of cloning, that is duplicating in the living flesh, the marks and characters uh, of straight manhood. Uh, and of course, what cloning uh, su suggests uh, ultimately, especially reproductive cloning, is the possibility of reproduction without sexual difference. That's really what it means. Uh, to clone something is to produce it from a, a single parent organism without a heterosexual uh, coupling being required. So cloning became the emblematic figurehead of a whole series of pretty much disconnected uh, phobias in American culture. The fear of homophobia, so you can say clon clonophobia is the big uh, symptom, but it includes homophobia, gynophobia, uh, and uh, the, the, the debate over abortion. Uh, because cloning is often also seen as uh, a mode of uh, as requiring uh, the abortion of a nascent or potential organism. Um, how are we doing here for time? 
I mean, one problem with my writing a book like this is I could go on for another hour, and I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I want to be careful with your patience here. The Boondocks cartoon, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. The, uh, the Boondocks cartoon is a diagnosis of the, uh, the relation between cloning and terrorism as political uh, images, as, uh, as icons. And in a way, this is like as if uh, uh, Magruder was getting inside of Karl Rove's mind and imagining the campaign commercials he could have made if he had been really candid about this. So these are can campaign commercials which bring Osama bin Laden. Uh, this is the October surprise. and These were pr produced in August of 2004, just before the election. Uh, and it's, it's all about, remember everybody was talking about the October surprise? They're going to capture Osama. So what Magruder does is capture Osama for us in a cartoon and has Osama reveal his, his real agenda. Uh, we call on all Muslims with knowledge of science and genetics to attack America. Develop baby-killing stem cell research that will destroy their evil society. Uh, and by the way, if I'm caught before November, it will be completely coincidental. Uh, it, this goes on. He, he, he carried it on for several days. Um, then there's an inevitable debate uh, of the talking heads. Today we're debating the new connection between stem cell research and Al-Qaeda. Uh, on the right, scientists caught doing stem cell research should be considered enemy combatants in the war on terrorism. And on the left, I agree. You remember how these debates went, uh, especially in Congress, uh, which is still going on. I mean, since the election, Congress has voted for the, perhaps the most shameful piece of legislation in the entire history uh, of this country. And that's basically to ratify everything George W. Bush has done by way of violating the Constitution, rights of habeas corpus, and, and you know the whole litany. The final episode, Crushing Stem Cell Research Part 6. With a link between Al-Qaeda and stem cell research firmly established, the attack ads begin. And then this shows John Kerry's vision of the future in which uh, an aging labor force will be unable to compete uh, because clones age more quickly. And of course, our soldiers will be all shriveled and wrinkled, still think stem cell research is a good idea. John Kerry and stem cell research will destroy America. So it's as if Magruder intuited this connection. He saw it and he just, he just made explicit what was uh, being tacitly uh, carried out in the Republican campaign of 2004. Okay, well, I, let, let me figure out how I can sweep to a conclusion here through about 20 <laughs> more slides. Uh, more on why clones are fearful, just because they're doubles. People have always been afraid of their double. It's uncanny. Uh, twins, as you know, are taboo in many cultures. And even worse, when they become quintuplets. The, the, the religious piety issue is crucial here. I mean, if, if terrorism is about religion, so is cloning. They are deeply linked at the level of, uh, in the one hand, uh, the holy war to kill for God, to die for God, and on the other hand, to uh, take control of reproduction is to play God, is to uh, commit an impious act. Uh, the homophobia issue gets transmitted directly into the images of Abu Ghraib. I think there's no doubt that the kind of pornography that was being reproduced there was what you might call straight men's fantasies about what homosexuals must be doing, uh, the kind of good time they must be having. Uh, this also, Rush Limbaugh wasn't totally wrong when he said, well, there's no, nothing worse than a, a Yale fraternity initiation. Uh, and maybe George W. Bush was doing this, you know, with, with skull and bones. Uh, but th this business of uh, stripping men naked, stacking them up and sexually humiliating them, I think it comes from a lot of places, but one of them is from uh, a sense of a kind of homophobic fantasy. Uh, and then the central icon, the one which declared the w that the war is over, that the moral uh, high ground had been irretrievably lost, was cloned indefinitely. This is a still from a, 
online video by a group called freewayblogger.com. Uh, if we had a lot of time, I would show you the whole, uh, the whole clip. But basically, they form a chorus line and dance to a Beach Boys song, which uh, is, about, uh, is addressed to the youth of America who are not going to college because the draft will be reinstated and they'll be going off to have a beach party in Iraq. Uh, this image, er, er, everywhere I look, of course, I see this. This is in uh, Ramon Casas uh, painting over in the Barcelona show. Uh, and it renders ambiguous to me the figure of the, the, uh, the torturer or the executioner and the victim on the one hand. And that's, in many ways, that ambiguity has been played on in renderings of the, um, uh, the man on the box, the Abu Ghraib man. I don't think I have time to talk about the way images of the sovereign uh, of the U.S. are uh, suddenly find their double uh, in anti-war posters like this. Uh, there is a real logic to this, uh, this response, treating Uncle Sam and Uncle Osama as, uh, as doubles. Uh, because the point of the attack on the World Trade Center was to produce a recruitment poster. Uh, this is Richard Clark's diagnosis. Al-Qaeda dreamed of propagating its movement by uh, luring uh, us into attacking and occupying an Arab country. Uh, more sovereign images. This one has a head and a crown, but you can see what we do to the sovereign uh, by way of uh, attacking the head. And remember I spoke before about the headless character of the clone. Uh, the emphasis on the head, and especially the head of the head of state, uh, is all too conspicuous. As is the innumerable scenes, remember, of decapitation and hooding, which become a central part in the display of decapitation, the staging of it. Uh, it used to be a sign of our humanity, too. That, oh, right, yes. That act. Yes. We were uh, j just looking after his health. Uh, actually, it finally occurred to me what's really going on here. Uh, perhaps you've already guessed it. Uh, it's, it I think partly to show our humanity that we're really caring for this uh, poor fellow, uh, but also to, to conduct a DNA test, make sure this is really Osama and not one of his numerous doubles. Of course, if Osama had been cloned, that wouldn't work because all of his doubles would then have the same, same DNA. And then the man on the box, Abu Ghraib man, and uh, the central icon who is then cloned indefinitely and in so many variations that uh, it would take a while to uh, go through them. Uh, the, uh, this one uh, is among my favorites because it actually puts on stage the naval ROTC captain's point about the weapons of mass destruction. This treats uh, the, the bionic Abu Ghraib man, that is the image of the Abu Ghraib man, as a transformer who, uh, in the final panel here, uh, is transformed into uh, a heavily armored uh, attack plane heading toward Mount Rushmore. And you can see Tom, George Washington saying, oh Jesus, he's headed right at, right at us. And uh, Jefferson is saying, literally or metaphorically? Literally or metaphorically? I can't turn my head. <laughs> this, by the way, is by a cartoonist named David Reese, R-E-E-S, who I think is one of the most brilliant uh, commentators on the, uh, on, on the war. Um, he, he has a, a website and I uh, urge you to look at it and look at Bionic Abu Ghraib Man in more detail. Obviously, I won't t take much time with this. It went all over the world into protest posters, into amazing murals like this in Baghdad, which coupled it with the Statue of Liberty, rendering the Statue of Liberty as the hooded torturer and the Abu Ghraib Man as the victim and connecting them uh, not just by similitude, but by metonymy, uh, the electrical wires instead of the torch of liberty. Uh, and the joke that emerged out of uh, Iraq after this image was circulated, with, was they started referring to the, the Abu Ghraib man simply as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and they said the, the Americans uh, spoke about bringing electricity back to Iraq, uh, but we didn't know it was going to take this form. 
And then these images, strange kind of clone. When I sh showed this a few weeks ago to uh, the, the filmmaker Errol, Errol Morris, he immediately said, they look like Oscars. And this one of my favorite by a group called Forkscrew Graphics. Uh, these are s silk screens uh, that are imitations of, of the iPod and are in fact in an act of inimitable culture jamming are sometimes inserted into the iPod display. <laughs> this is Bleecker Street uh, Station in New York City. Uh, and the, I think this also bears a lot of thinking about. Uh, partly because it, uh, it, depending on your mood, you can read this as uh, the moment when the Abu Ghraib man began to disappear and become neutralized by mass culture. Just another image. Uh, remember the Abu Ghraib scandal lasted about one month. And then uh, the American mass media declared, as they tend to do, well, the news cycle has moved on. And uh, one of my tasks in this whole project has been to say, to resist the news cycle and to say, no, I will not let it move on. I'm going to keep showing this image and bringing it back. So you can be depressed about this. That, you know, it just becomes like another corporate logo. Or you can no spend some time thinking about it and notice that the image of iPod narcissism, uh, of self-pleasuring uh, and uh, self-satisfied isolation, and the image of torture do have this incredible resonance with one another. Uh, both are about absorption, both are about wire, being wired up uh, for extreme sensations. And then there, of course, is the Christological side of the Abu Ghraib uh, images, which echoes the entire panoply of passion images. The fact that these images were released at the same time as Mel Gibson's uh, completely despicable film, uh, The Passion of the Christ, only under, underwrites and underlines the, uh, the resonance. There was also not only a homophobic uh, scenario being staged at Abu Ghraib, but a kind of obscene passion play, including hooding, masking. And this comes down to my, th this was November 2004. And this was the reaction of Der Spiegel in Germany the uh, legend Augen zu und durch uh, means I shut and plunge forward, uh, which was the German reaction fundamentally to the election, uh, the American election. This then, the last image I'll show you, is Hans Hacke's uh, marvelous uh, photograph entitled Stargazing, <laughs> which I would think, you know, you could take this as an emblem of a great many things I've been talking about of the hooded, acephalic uh, uh, torture victim, the uh, one who's been rendered uh, anonymous, uh, hooded so that uh, we can't recognize them. Just imagine eye holes in this and you move over to the torturer or the terrorist. Uh, perfect twins, clones of each other. Uh, it's also in, in light of the Osama with his American flag uh, blindfold, uh, and the Statue of Liberty with its blindfold, or the earlier Statue of Liberty with its Ku Klux Klan hood, uh, a kind of perfect uh, an emblem in my mind of the, what happened to the American people in this terrible period, uh, gazing on the stars. Haka exhibited this image the first time in a, a show in New York uh, in, entitled State of the Union. And this was the central uh, image from it. And I think uh, it was uh, an, an image of the State of the Union until November 2006. At which point, finally, this guy in the orange jumpsuit realized he could reach up and take off the hood and look at the real world. I hope that's what it meant. 